came the miracle maker. During his first year with the Leafs, he pulled off one of the more lopsided trades in NHL history. It was a 10-player deal with his former team in Calgary that changed the fortunes of the Leaf organization. It's a situation that was very unusual in that I knew more about the players I was acquiring than the ones I was giving up because the ones I was giving up had only been with a few months. So, uh, I mean, you never expect a trade to work out like that. The Leafs went from one of the worst teams in the league to two consecutive trips to the conference finals. It was another master stroke by Cliff. When he left the Leafs in 1997, they were a stronger organization than when he arrived. After a short time with Tampa Bay, Cliff is now the Senior Executive Vice President of Hockey Operations with the Phoenix Coyotes. It's no coincidence that success has followed around Cliff Fletcher's teams. He has a unique ability to find talent and build clubs, and he's made it look as easy as playing a game of Monopoly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cliff Fletcher. Inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in the Builder category. Thank you very much. Let me begin by first expressing my gratitude to uh, Bill Hay, Jim Gregory, and the members of the Selection Committee for bestowing this honor upon me which means more than words can say. <clears throat> I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate my fellow inductees, Larry Murphy, Paul Coffey, and Raymond Bourque. Larry, I had the great fortune to have you play for my team, and Paul and Ray, it was my great misfortune to have you play against my teams for all those years. <laughs> I'm very proud to be enshrined alongside you tonight. First of all, I would like to thank my family for their unending support. I am proud that my children, Chuck and Christy, are accomplished executives in their own right. And my wife, Linda, has been my biggest supporter in good times and bad. I can never hope to repay you for all you've given me. The Montreal Canadiens gave me my first chance, long before anyone thought I would get one. The St. Louis Blues showed faith in me and let me see how a team was built from the ground up. The Atlanta Flames made me a general manager at 36, and then the Calgary Flames gave me some of the best years of my life and a Stanley Cup. The Toronto Maple Police reinvigorated me and gave me a chance to work in the most passionate hockey market in the world, while the Tampa Bay Lightning and Phoenix Coyotes gave me a new lease on life, perhaps later than anyone thought I would get one. To those organizations, I can only say thank you from the bottom of my heart. It has been an honor to work for you and to have been associated with your outstanding people. Imagine, I began my hockey life working under the incomparable Sam Pollock and the legendary Scotty Bowman. Well, today I work with Wayne Gretzky the greatest player who ever lived. I am truly blessed. A successful general manager needs many things, starting with great players, and I've been fortunate to have been associated with the very best. Some have been honored here at the Hall. Lanny McDonald, Grant Fuhr, Joel Mullen, Mike Gardner, and tonight, Larry Murphy. Others, like Al McGinnis, Mike Vernon, Joe Neuendijk, Matt Sundin, Glenn Anderson, Doug Gilmore, and Wendell Clark have had, or in some cases, are still having outstanding careers. I have also been proud to have been associated with players whose character is the very definition of what our game is about. My first captains in Atlanta, Keith McCreary and Pat Quinn, along with the likes of Jim Poplinski, Doug Riseborough, Tim Hunter, and Brad McCrimmon. As a kid growing up in Canada, I idolized hockey players. Now having spent the last 48 years working closely with them, I can honestly say I admire them even more. <clears throat> from the soup, for all those players who played for me, from the superstars to the hardworking role players, thank you. 
The GM also needs strong management support and great coaching. David Poyle, Al McNeil, Al Coates, and Bill Waters provided me with tremendous contributions. While coaches like Boom Boom Jeffreyon, Fred Creighton, Bob Johnson, Terry Crisp, and Pat Burns have given so much to the game, and the results speak for themselves. The greatest strength of this game is the people associated with it, and it is the community of hockey that I treasure most. General managers like Bill Torrey, Harry Sinden, Bob Pulford, Lou Nanny, and Bob Clark were colleagues, competitors, and great friends. While the scouts, trainers, assistant coaches, and front office people made every day of my hockey career worthwhile, it is because of them that I can truly say I have spent every day of my hockey life looking forward to going to work. As a young boy growing up in Montreal, I met a kid across the street who became a lifelong friend. We both had dreams of having a life in hockey, and amazingly enough, I became a general manager while Wally Harris grew up to be a career NHL referee. Now, general managers and referees don't always see eye to eye, and there were certainly times when I disagree with Wally. But our friendship managed to survive his occasional lapses in judgment, <laughs> showing once again what the community of hockey is all about. I owe everything I have to this game, and I don't mean material things. My closest friendships and my fondest memories are all a direct result of my involvement in hockey. The game is going through a difficult time now, but it has before. And it has always prospered because of the people involved and their willingness to put the good of the sport ahead of their own interests. I'm confident it will happen in this case as well, and that we'll be back stronger than ever, all of us doing our part. Hockey is the greatest game in the world because it involves the greatest people you could ever hope to meet. Once again, my congratulations to my fellow inductees and my thanks to the selection committee and to the Hall of Fame for treating us well, so well, throughout these past few days. I have treasured every day of my hockey life, and now you have given me another day I will never forget. Thank you very much. The induction ceremony is the culmination of a busy weekend at the Hockey Hall of Fame. We'll look at the festivities surrounding the Hall of Fame weekend, which this year included the inaugural Legends Game. So what's this about our Guinness again? I've discovered that Guinness Draft has only 125 calories. Only 125 calories? Brilliant! What else have you been up to? I've invented this little book. It's black. You put women's phone numbers in it. A little black book? Brilliant! <clears throat> uh, come here often. You can also use it as a coaster. A coaster? Brilliant! Brilliant! Guinness Draft has only 125 calories. Enjoy it responsibly. Brilliant! Ice time did you log last game? Sincerely, Mark. Dear Mark, which game? If you have Comcast Digital Cable, you'll soon see exciting new improvements to the way you find all of your favorite shows. Soon, you'll be able to see further into the future. Fly through channels faster than ever. 
Plus, you'll be able to access all your favorite features with just one click, including On Demand, with hundreds of free shows you can start whenever you're ready. The new on-screen program guide is coming. Only to Comcast Digital Cable. Hey, B. Hicks. Right here. I'm busy. Figure out which of these minivans is right for my family. Got it. Comparing vehicles isn't easy, but VHIX does the hard part from specifications oh, good on headroom. to optional features DVD player to giving you your own side-by-side -side report. Did I wake you? No, I was just... You were sleeping. Because you've got better things to do. Give me that. VHIX.com, roadmap to the automotive world. Thank you and welcome back. Tonight's induction ceremony and the days leading up to it are the most important dates on the calendar for everyone here at the Hockey Hall of Fame. For the hockey fan, this is the ultimate time to visit the hall and take in the many activities. Here's a look at the very busy Hockey Hall of Fame induction weekend. Induction weekend is one of the busiest times of year at the Hockey Hall of Fame. This year, the weekend was filled with exciting activities starting on Friday with the official opening of the new Collector's Corner exhibit. Cards, coins, tabletop games, figurines, stamps, and many more hockey collectible items from the past 80 years were on display. Honored member Jerry Cheevers was on hand for the official opening. I think it's really a neat corner. I mean, going around doing shows and everything, you see what everyone has, and all of a, come, all of a sudden you come into the Hockey Hall of Fame, and it's, it's all here, right? And uh, I love looking at the cards, the, the bubblegum cards, because I like seeing myself with hair. Friday was also the unveiling of the Shoot for a Cure custom goalie mask fundraising program. Masks with designs by the Bare Naked Ladies, Mike Weir's family, Nickelback, Don Cherry, and the Tragically Hip were put up for auction with proceeds going to the Shoot for a Cure program helping the Canadian Spinal Research Program. On Saturday, hockey fans had the chance to have their picture taken with the Stanley Cup. To make the picture even more special, honored members were present, making every picture a memorable one. We as, as members, or we as uh, hockey players, um, remember what it was like growing up and uh, wondering what it was like, uh, you know, to touch the cup or to see the cup. And if you came from a small rural town, you knew that might never happen. So um, I can kind of associate with a lot of these people who want to come in and, uh, and at least touch the cup. After having their pictures taken with fans, honored members hurried to the Air Canada Centre for the inaugural Hockey Hall of Fame Legends Classic Heritage Game. Prior to the game, the official Blazer presentation was made to each of this year's inductees. It was the first time that the public was able to witness the Blazer ceremony. Playing in the National Hockey League is a dream come true for me growing up in Toronto. And I tell you, that now I'm here in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Who would ever believe it? After the ceremony was complete, the original six legends and the expansion legends treated hockey fans to an afternoon of hockey and fun. When the game ended, the Hockey Hall of Fame turned into a concert hall for Jim Cuddy's All-Stars. It was a chance for players to enjoy some music and relax before Monday's induction ceremony. One of the more popular events each year is Sunday's Fan Forum. It gives hockey fans an opportunity to ask questions of this year's inductees. With a casual atmosphere, the forum is an enjoyable time for both the fans and inductees. Yeah, I think it was a really nice format where, uh, you know, the fans were right there and uh, you have kind of a sense of connection there where, you know, uh, we're real close answering questions and answer all kinds of questions. Uh, the business side, the fun side, the, uh, the kids side of, of a lot of different things. So uh, I think uh, I really enjoyed it. That was a lot of fun. So a good time was had by all. Of all the possible media assignments, broadcasters and journalists who cover the sport of hockey have an enviable task. Broadcasters, at least we try, convey a sport that is in itself one of the most exciting displays of skill and strength, while journalists write for a committed audience that is passionate about the game. Each year as part of the Hockey Hall of Fame induction activities, the Foster Hewitt Memorial Award and the Elmer Ferguson Award are given to honor outstanding work in broadcasting and in journalism. This year, the Carolina Hurricanes' irrepressible and very excitable play-by-play -play broadcaster Chuck Caton 
and one of hockey's wisest scribes, as they used to be called, Jim Kelly, were presented with the awards that happened earlier today. To most sports fans, Buffalo's Jim Kelly is the former Bills quarterback who led the team to four Super Bowls. But hockey fans in the Buffalo area are loyal to another Jim Kelly. Starting in 1980, if you wanted to know about the Buffalo Sabres, you read the stories written by Jim Kelly of the Buffalo News. Everybody loves to embrace hockey as something like Canadians do. It fills the wintertime. So it was always, to me, it was like, maybe it didn't have the glory that is associated with football. But this is who we were, and this is what we enjoyed. And so hockey and the Sabres were always king in Buffalo. Throughout his career that spans over two decades, Jim has also written for numerous hockey magazines. He's currently the online hockey columnist for ESPN.com, where his thoughts and ideas can be enjoyed by hockey fans around the world. Jim Kelly is this year's recipient of the Elmer Ferguson Memorial Award, presented by the Professional Hockey Writers Association in recognition of distinguished members of the newspaper profession whose words have brought honor to journalism and the game of hockey. I took pride in the fact that under my name was the truth as best I could write it and best I could find it. And if you had anything in this business at all, it was your integrity under your name. And I got that from my parents, and my sisters, and my family here. When the Hartford Whalers joined the NHL in 1979-80, Chuck Caton became their play-by-play -play voice. While the Whalers are gone, Caton is still broadcasting games for the organization, now the Carolina Hurricanes. He has broadcast 2,257 professional games, making him one of only seven active broadcasters to announce 2,000 or more games with the same team. I always said when I got a job in the NHL, and I was lucky to get one very early in my career, that I wanted to be the Al Kaline, so to speak, of hockey. Al was, of course, uh, one of my idols of baseball growing up as a kid in Detroit, and he was with one team. And I, and I feel a very sense of uh, strict pride with being with one team. Chuck's dedication to the game is evident in his role as president of the National Hockey League Broadcasters Association, a title he's held since 1986. Chuck Caton is honored with the Foster Hewitt Memorial Award in recognition of members of the radio and television industry who have made outstanding contributions to their profession and to the game of hockey. To be recognized like this is uh, just something I can't describe because it's not something I set out to do originally. I set out to have a one-to-one -one relationship with a listener and to, to have it turn into this and to be uh, honored this way with uh, uh, some of my uh, most esteemed colleagues both uh, with us and uh, having passed on like the Dan Kellys and Danny Gallivans and Gene Hartz and those here today uh, that were a part of this is just absolutely stunning. and. Uh, Again, I, I feel very humbled by it. He was the consummate thinker, calculating time and speed to maximize his abilities. Larry Murphy enters the Hockey Hall of Fame when we return. That's when I was at my best, was when, when I was sharp mentally. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Worked out quite nicely for you on a couple of different occasions. Four cups in all, two in Pittsburgh and two in Detroit. Well, you know, I can remember like it was yesterday in Pittsburgh. We, uh, we had a good defense. We had a real great bunch of forwards, but we needed an offensive defenseman. And we made the deal with Minnesota, and Larry went on to win the two cups there. And then, fortunately, when I got to Detroit uh, in, uh, I think it was 97, the trade deadline, uh, we were looking for another defenseman, maybe just to finish the year, and Larry came along, and, you know, he's a perfect fit. Uh, he, uh, he played with Nick Lidstrom most of his career in Detroit, Ulf Samuelson uh, in Pittsburgh, and he, he just knew how to play the game. If you were winning, you couldn't have a player on the ice you could really trust better. If you are down, he could really gamble enough to help you get back in the game, and, uh, you know, he was so durable. Larry missed very few games, and uh, to cap his career with those four cups, uh, they came about uh, six years apart, but he was a big part of both of those teams because of the fact that he, you could use him in all situations. You're a kind of guy who goes out and gets what he has to get in order to win. What was it that you liked so much about Larry's defensive prowess? Well, we were looking for an offensive defenseman in Pittsburgh, and uh, when we made the deal with Minnesota. I watched him play for about 10 days, and uh, truthfully, I came back and told uh, Craig Patrick, I said, you know, I don't know if he's going to be able to help us a lot against the top forwards of the other team, but he's going to be able to help our forwards because we had a good offensive uh, bunch of forwards. But he was better than I thought, and he just knew the game. He knew how to play, as I said, with or against the lead, 
you couldn't have had a better fit for a team, and uh, that's why those teams won. Scotty, thanks a lot for this. Go enjoy Larry Murphy's induction. Thank you, Gina. Dick. Okay, Gino, thank you, gentlemen. When our next player inductee made his NHL debut in 1980-81, he set the record for most points by a rookie defenseman, which is yet to be broken. This beginning proved very positive, and a unique style of offensive defenseman emerged. Throughout his stellar 21-year career, an uncanny ability to read the play, just like Scotty said, and pass the puck, which was shared by few, emerged, growing stronger and more confident each season. This player improved as he matured, remaining highly productive up to his retirement in 2001. Finishing fifth in all-time scoring for a defenseman, Larry Murphy earned respect at both ends of the rink and a place in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Players inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame are there for a reason. They each have a skill that made them excel at a level far greater than their peers. There are those who could score. Shoot. Skate. And make saves. Larry Murphy's skill was that he could think the game better than almost any player of his generation. The mental part of the game was critical for me, and that's and I, um, I always felt that if I could um, just just be real smart and always be aware of of everyone on the ice, whether your team, the opposition team, always be aware of where I was and and maybe just calculated risks made before making a decision, deciding whether um, you know how what's the chances of succeeding with this. Is that you know it just always calculating, I guess, on the ice. Murphy was drafted fourth overall by Los Angeles in 1980 and immediately stepped into their lineup. The Kings were looking for an offensive defenseman, and Larry was exactly that. He scored 76 points as a rookie, the first of five 70-plus point seasons during his NHL career. After three seasons in Los Angeles, Larry was traded to Washington, where defense became a bigger part of the game. Larry wasn't overly physical, but he worked on becoming a solid defender. I'm a type of player that relies on, on being in the right place at, at the right time. I'm not, not a lot of flash to my game. I always pride myself on, a, on effectiveness, just uh, being as effective as you can out there, whether it's in your own end or in the opposition's end, and just doing what, making the smart play, um, you know, make, you know, being strong defensively, being right, and it always goes back to position. I always relied on being in the, in the right, right position at the right time, and and that's how I, I, I approach the game. I, I, I figured, I knew going in, I wasn't going to be the, the fastest skater, I wasn't going to have the hardest shot, but I knew I, I could be as effective as any player, and that, and that's that was the approach I took. Timing was everything in 1990 when Larry found himself in the perfect place, Pittsburgh. The Penguins had an offensive-minded team that perfectly suited his style. He was a big part of the Penguins' two Stanley Cup championships in 1991 and 92. The Penguins were led by Mario Lemieux, but when it came to the power play, it was Larry that was the quarterback. There's different ways to have a successful power play. The key is execution was so important. So um, for me, I just, whatever we're trying to achieve, it was just, you know, it was, it was a simple approach. Just, go out uh, and, and do it. And I think puck control was was very important to get the puck in the opposition's end and then if uh, settle it down. That, that's the way I tried to do it. If, if the puck came to me, there's just an opportunity to settle it down. If you can freeze the opposition, let, you know, cause them to pause, then, then you can execute the, the play you wanted to do. Throughout his career, Larry was also known for his uncanny ability to pass the puck. He was especially good at making the first pass out of his zone, an important part of the game that can make a defenseman invaluable to his team. Well, first pass is critical, of course. Um, it can get you out of a jam pretty quick if, um, you know, if the scramble's on in your end. If you get a hold of the puck and you're able to make a clean pass to somebody open, well, then the pressure's off. Larry enjoyed tremendous success throughout his career. In addition to the two Stanley Cups in Pittsburgh, he won two more in Detroit. He also won a Memorial Cup in Peterborough and the Canada Cup in 1987 when he was involved in the memorable series winning goal. One of the keys to his success was a simple philosophy. Don't put yourself in the corner. That was always uh, um, what I tried to do was uh, 
get a hold of the puck, uh, have as many options as possible, and when one closes down, take advantage of the other. Don't put your, I always, I try to avoid putting myself in a position where I, I only had one option, because if that gets shut down on you, then you're, you're in big trouble. Larry Murphy was known as an offensive defenseman, and his numbers bear that out. He finished his career with 287 goals and 1,216 points. He attained those numbers without possessing a big shot or great speed. Instead, he used his hockey sense and ability to play the game at his speed, to become a defenseman who could dictate play at both ends of the ice. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Larry Murphy, inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in the player category. Oh, well, we'll see how calm and cool and collective I can be at this moment. This is it's a lot easier playing, that's for sure. But uh, good evening, everyone. I'm extremely honored to be here. Tonight, I feel fortunate to be surrounded by many of the people who have had a profound effect on my life and career. People who have shared my hopes and dreams and have ultimately been responsible for me being here this evening. To be in the Hockey Hall of Fame in such esteemed company is an honor and a privilege. On these walls are the greatest players to ever play the game. To be included in this group is an affirmation of my career. I would like to thank the selection committee for honoring me in this way, and I'd like to congratulate Cliff Fletcher a general manager and executive who has shown that you can achieve great success with class and dignity. And Ray and Paul, congratulations. You have been the players who all other defensemen measure themselves by. To be included in this group is both privilege and a great compliment to me. As a boy growing up in Scarborough, I never dreamed as big as the Hockey Hall of Fame but I did dream of playing in the National Hockey League. I spent countless hours at home in our backyard with my friends playing for the Leafs and winning hundreds of Stanley Cups. <laughs> my parents were avid hockey fans and I would go and watch my older brother, Rick, play. I still remember the first time I ever played hockey. My father dressed me in my brother's old equipment. I was five years old and I had never been on skates. By the end of the practice, my toes were frozen. During that first year, my dad began the ritual of taking me to the dressing room and running my toes under warm water after the game. Each week, the frozen toes of the free previous week forgotten, I couldn't wait to get back on the ice. I was hooked on the greatest game on earth. Saturday nights were big in our house, Hockey night in Canada. We were a house divided. My mom, brother, and I were Leaf fans. My dad was a Montreal Canadiens fan. That rivalry created a lot of great memories and a lot of raised voices over the years. As I continued to grow older, my parents continued to support my growth in hockey. They drove me to ice rinks at outrageous hours and watched every game I played in. They never complained and kept the game fun for me. My father has since passed away, and I regret he could not be here to share this great honor with me and my mom tonight. As I continue on my journey, I was fortunate to play junior for the Peterborough Peets. The two years I was with the Peets, I feel I showed my greatest development as a player. Gary Green was the coach, and he guided us to a Memorial Cup win in my first season. The following season, Mike Keenan was instrumental in taking us back to the Memorial Cup Finals. Unfortunately, unsuccessful. The following summer, I was drafted by the Los Angeles Kings. It didn't matter that I would be thousands of miles away from home. My NHL dream was realized. LA gave me the opportunity to establish myself as a player in this great league. Over the years, I have played on great teams with great players and great coaches. 
Every experience helped me to grow as a player. Several things, however, impacted my career significantly. First was winning the Stanley Cup. Being part of a Stanley Cup championship team was always a priority, and winning under the late Bob Johnson with his positive attitude and enthusiasm made it even more special. Second was playing for Scotty Bowman. He was a brilliant tactician and provided me with the opportunity and sound direction. Playing under the leadership of Scotty Bowman gave me some of the greatest moments of my career with both Pittsburgh and Detroit. I would like to thank him for his belief in me. 21 years in the National Hockey League has given me more memories and experiences than I can relay. Tonight, however, is accumulation of the lifetime of playing a game that I love. To be honored for playing a game that has been a gift in my life is very humbling. To all the people who have been a part of my life and my success, I thank you. To my lovely wife, Nancy, I thank you. You are my best friend and partner. I cannot overstate the positive impact you have had on my life and hockey career. You are the biggest reason why I am standing up here tonight. It was not only the personal sacrifices that you made, but it was also the guidance and support you gave me through the ups and downs that a national hockey career gives you. Madison, my oldest daughter, Alexa, and Luke, my three wonderful children, you have made me extremely and an extremely proud father. I love you all. Tonight, however, oops, sorry. Thank you for being, <laughs> on to the next page. Thank you for being a part of my journey, for supporting me and believing in me. Thank you all for the honor of allowing me to enter into the Hockey Hall of Fame I will remember this moment for the rest of my life. Thank you. He is the all-time leader in points by a defenseman, yet he is best known for his ability to shine in every aspect of the game. Ray Bork's brilliant career ends with his induction to the Hockey Hall of Fame. Mmm, something smells good. Delivery? No, it's not delivery, it's DiGiorno. DiGiorno? Get out. You fix the oven. You fix the oven? <laughs> you are handy. I'm calling mother. <laughs> pizza? Introducing DiGiorno Microwave Pizza. Rises up golden brown in minutes. For oven baked taste in a hurry, it's not delivery, it's DiGiorno. Microwave. Microwave, huh? At least I fixed something. So what's this about our Guinness again? I've discovered that Guinness Draft has only 125 calories. Only 125 calories? Brilliant! What else have you been up to? I've invented this little book. It's black. You put women's phone numbers in it. A little black book? Brilliant! <clears throat> uh, come here often. You can also use it as a coaster. A coaster? Brilliant! Brilliant! Guinness Draft has only 125 calories. Enjoy it responsibly. Brilliant! Introduces high definition plasma TV with the most beautiful picture in the world. Yours. No, it's mine. It's my vacation. It's got to be my game. Make it yours. Just snap it and share it instantly with built in photo viewer. The most beautiful picture in the world. I'm pretty sure it's mine. High definition plasma TV from Panasonic. Ideas for life.
restaurants, shopping. Boston offers all of us who live in New England a variety of choices. But when it comes to driving in New England, there's only one choice, and that's Subaru. Subaru is America's number one selling all-wheel drive vehicle. Subaru's all-wheel drive all year long gives the New England driver total safety, comfort, and control. All-wheel drive. It's all all drive. Welcome back. One of the most touching moments I feel in Stanley Cup history occurred in June of 2001. When Joe Sackick passed the Stanley Cup to our next inductee, there was rejoicing and a sigh of relief throughout the hockey fraternity that made a lasting impression on me and everybody else who saw it. After 20 years as a quintessential Boston Bruin, a gamble to go to a contender paid off and the missing crown jewel in what we knew was going to be a Hall of Fame career was finally realized. There is little needed to be said, except that for 22 seasons, his passion and competitiveness characterized what a defenseman and what a hockey player should be. And now tonight, even though the end result is much more certain than that night in June of 2001, we all share the joy once again as Ray Bork enters the Hall of Fame. As the Montreal Canadiens were winning four consecutive Stanley Cups in the late 1970s, much of their success came at the expense of the Boston Bruins. The Bruins didn't find many positives in losing to the Canadians until they drafted a young defenseman from the Montreal area who grew up watching and learning from the big three defensemen who anchored Montreal's victories over Boston. Ray Bork made an immediate impact at the NHL level after being drafted eighth overall in 1979. He was a plus 52 in his first year, capturing Rookie of the Year honors in 1980 the first of many awards he would win during his 22-year career. I just went in there trying to make the team. I was very confident that I was going to, um, you know, do well, but, you know, to play with these guys and being in the NHL and, and uh, scoring 17 goals, I think, my first year and having uh, 65 points and, um, you know, winning the Rookie of the Year, uh, being named, I think, first team All-Star. I mean, I was just blown away. Ray's Rookie of the Year was an early indication of the great career that was ahead of him. He became a five-time Norris Trophy winner and played in an incredible 19 All-Star games. With 410 career goals and 1,579 points, Ray's offensive numbers alone are impressive enough for Hall of Fame induction. But Ray mastered all facets of the game, which is what made him the dominant all-round defenseman of his era. I think I compete. Uh to the fullest and expecting myself to go out and compete and uh, when you have talent and ability and you go out with an attitude to uh, compete and uh, try to be the best you could be game in game out you're going to have success and uh, you know just a well-rounded game uh, able to, to play any kind of game uh, power play penalty kill uh, play a lot of minutes um, play physical uh, whatever needed to be done I was able to do. One of the many skills that Ray was blessed with was being able to get his shot from the point to the net. With all the traffic between the blue line and the net, many defensemen have a hard time getting a shot through. It's an aspect of the game that goes unnoticed to many, but was a key part to Ray's game. Execution is key uh, to a defenseman's shot and getting on net. If you take forever to shoot the puck, you're going to have a lot of shots tipped into the stands. Um, but uh, you got to recognize those situation on people coming out, finding lanes, the open lanes, um, and then getting it to the net. Uh, and sometimes, a lot of times, it's just a wrist shot and that quick shot, and it's not the big bomb that a lot of kids like to take now. When he had the puck, Ray was always dangerous. Yet one of his greatest talents was to know what to do when the puck wasn't on his stick. It's crucial to know uh, when you don't have the puck uh, what you should be doing. And... Uh, it's, it's good when you, earlier the better, in terms of learning that, I think is, uh, is very important. The most penalty minutes Ray accumulated in one season was 96, but he never shied away from the physical part of the game. While he didn't spend a lot of time fighting, he was a fierce competitor in front of the net and liked to send a physical message early in each game. I think you talk to people that run into me, they'll tell you that, you know, it was a pretty solid guy. 
and uh, tried to bring that into every game I played early. I wanted to get it, make sure that um, you know people felt my presence. Um, nothing crazy, but in a subtle way, they know I'm there, and they know they're going to be in a battle. Ray spent 20 years applying his skills as a Bruin and became a legend in Boston. He led the Bruins to two Stanley Cup finals, but came up short each time. It looked like he would retire a Bruin and without a Stanley Cup ring. Ray would have liked nothing more than to win a championship in Boston, but he realized it wasn't going to happen, and he wanted to fill the one void on his resume. There's always one thing, and uh, yeah, he's a great player, he's this, he's that, but, you know, and it was always that but, and I always played it down in terms of the but never, you know, but that burned in me. Whenever I heard that but, it was a major burn. To eliminate the burn and take aim at winning the Stanley Cup, Ray did what he had been reluctant to do previously, ask to be traded. In 2000, he was sent to the Colorado Avalanche. After losing in the Western Conference Final that season, Ray was finally able to capture the Stanley Cup in 2001. And after 22 years, Raymond Mark! When I lifted the cup, it was all that emotion and uh, all the hard work, and, and uh, it was just, just complete. You know, I knew going into that year that this was it for me. My wife and I, we knew, and uh, knowing that I won my last game, we got it done. That's why we went to Colorado. Ray Bork was the fourth defenseman drafted in 1979. At that time, little did anyone know that he would join other Bruin defensemen as one of the best in hockey history. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ray Bork, inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in the player category. Thank you. Is it hot in here or is it just me? Uh, I think that was the best pass Joe Sackick ever made uh, in my books. But it's, uh, it's a pleasure being here. I'd like to thank uh, Jim Gregory, Bill Hay, and Kelly Massey and her staff for uh, really a fabulous weekend. We've had a blast. It is such an honor to be here. As a rookie walking into the NHL in a dressing room for the first time, the thought of making it into the Hockey Hall of Fame doesn't even cross your mind. All you want to do is make the team and try to establish yourself as a solid NHL player. Now when I look back at all I have accomplished, I just go, wow, what a ride. And to be inducted with these great players, Paul Coffey, Larry Murphy, and a builder like Cliff Fletcher makes it even more special. I mean, we've had a blast this weekend, and these are special guys. I'd also like to congratulate Jim and Chuck. No one makes this to this podium, to this place of honor, without help and support of a lot of people. In every stage of your life, no matter what we do, there are friends and family who pitch in and make a big difference. There's a popular saying that it takes a village to raise a child. And that is very true when it comes to developing a professional athlete. It takes a lot of people to make it happen. I could be here all night naming names and thanking everyone who has touched my life along the way. There are those who have been there for the entire journey, and some, I'm sorry, can't be here. I lost my mom when I was 12, and I wish she could have seen all of this. But I know she's looking down on me tonight and is very proud. My family, my father, my stepmother, my brothers and my sisters have been there supporting me and I thank you for that. I have said before that my dad was my biggest fan. After every game he was the guy who said nice job Ray whether I played well or not. He was always there for me and I thank you dad. When Chris and I got married, her whole family, the LaForests, were incredibly supportive of us in every step of the way, and I thank them. Outside of my family, perhaps the most important person of all was my good friend, Benoit Lezuc. 
Ben took me under his wing when I was a 14-year-old high school student. He taught me about hard work and commitment. Ben helped me become a dedicated, motivated man. Merci, ben. Even though it didn't end the way we all hoped in Boston, I thank Harry Sinden for drafting me, and I thank the Bruins organization and the Jacobs family for everything they did for me over the years. There could not have been a better place, a better organization for me to break in with. As an 18-year-old walking in a locker room full of veterans, I was in awe. But I learned everything about what being a Bruin meant from guys like Terry O'Reilly, Wayne Cashman, and all the other leaders in that dressing room. I learned the importance of tradition and values of being a Bruin, and I tried to pass those things on. Fellow Hall of Famer Brad Park taught me so much about how, how to play my position. He was generous in passing along everything he knew, and I was a sponge just sucking it all in. Playing in, playing in the old Boston Garden was like being in hockey heaven. What made it that way were the fans because of their passion for the Bruins and the game of hockey. They always treated me with respect and I return that feeling. Boston was a great place to play and raise a family, and it's our home now, where we have made so many good friends. And I'd like to acknowledge a couple of my friends tonight that are here. Steve Fryer and Susan, thank you so much for everything you did for Chris and I in so many different ways. Pierre Lacroix and the Colorado Avalanche gave me the opportunity to play for the one thing missing in my career, the Stanley Cup. That was an unbelievable team, and it will send several players to this Hall of Fame. Thank you to everyone in Colorado, the fans, the Avs organization. You are first class in every way. Je voudrais dire un gros merci à tous les partisans et mes amis de Montréal et Québec pour m'avoir supporté au courant des années et aussi aux Canadiens de Montréal pour avoir fait rêver un jeune homme de la ville Saint-Laurent de un jour souhaiter de jouer dans la, la, la Ligue nationale. But without question, the most important people in my life are my beautiful wife, Christiane, and my three children, Melissa, Christopher, and Ryan. They supported me and loved me and endured some tough times so I could pursue my dream. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I love you guys. Since I retire, people often ask what I miss most, and the answer is easy. I miss the guys. I miss the anticipation of the games. I miss the feeling of going into battle with teammates you truly care about. I miss driving to work with a big smile on my face, and once you get there, acting like a 15-year-old kid, or younger. <laughs> Believe it or not, I played with 313 different teammates in the NHL. I played 757 games with Don Sweeney, and that was the most by far. But I also played one game with 12 different guys. And I want to thank all of you, because you are what made it special. I also had 11 coaches and many, many assistant coaches and trainers. They are a huge part of the success of every team, and I thank them all, too. Hockey has given me everything I have in life. I owe hockey a lot more than it will ever owe me. Hockey has taken me to places I only dreamed of as a young boy. Hockey taught me lessons of winning and losing and it taught me to stand up for my teammates and myself. Hockey taught me no matter what, you have to do your very best every time you lace up those skates. Hockey has been my life. To me this night, having the Hockey Hall of Fame honor me by making me part of this special fraternity is just beyond my wildest dream, and I will remember this night forever. Thank you all very, very much, and good night.
Thank you, Ray. And that concludes the 2004 Hockey Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Congratulations to our four new inductees, Raymond Bork, Paul Coffey, Cliff Fletcher, and Larry Murphy. Tonight was truly special as four names that have been synonymous with hockey over the last two decades have been fittingly honored. Their careers have become hockey history, and they have changed this great game for the better. A special thanks to everyone here at the Hall, and also thanks to the fans at home for joining us on this historic occasion. That's it from the Great Hall tonight, but don't go away. In a moment, we'll join Gino Retta for the signing of the honored members in the book by tonight's inductees. Thanks for joining us. So long for now. Good night, everybody. The 2004 Hockey Hall of Fame induction ceremony is brought to you by Molson Canadian. I am Canadian. By Kodak Easy Share System. Digital made simple. Prints made beautiful. By Hugo Boss. By RBC Local Hockey Leaders Program. Recognize the hockey volunteer in your community. To nominate, visit rbc.com. And by the Royal Canadian Mint. Celebrating the hopes and dreams of Canadian athletes with a special lucky loony. This ESPN Classic Program is brought to you by ADT, America's residential and commercial security leader. Call 1-800-ADT-ASAP. Somewhere, there's a man accessing sensitive information by way of a fingerprint, while a woman keeps track of millions of dollars in inventory, safeguarding it from the warehouse to your house. And a dad checks on his business from his son's baseball game. What do all these people have in common? They rely on America's number one security company, ADT. Always there. So what's this about the bottle? Well, you know how we look so fit in our swim trunks. Yes. I've discovered that our Guinness Draft has only 125 calories. Only 125 calories? Brilliant! What else are you working on? You know how your skin burns if you're on the beach too long? Yes, it stings like the dickens. Well, I've invented a lotion that protects you from the sun's rays. Ah! Brilliant! Brilliant! Guinness Draft has only 125 calories. Enjoy it responsibly. Brilliant! Two letters. TV. Simple, right? Except these days there's HDTV, EDTV. We could get an LCD TV. If we don't get help, we'll end up with NOTV. I guess you just what I need. What At Circuit I need. City, you'll find a huge selection of the latest TVs. And right now, pay no interest for 18 months on all digital TVs, $6.99 and up. Circuit City. You just what I need. One of the reasons we play so well on the road is because we have a team out. And then what happened? John Elway drove 98 yards. She definitely cares about what we eat. Ooh, Miss McNabb, Miss McNabb. Yeah, keep driving. Oh, come on. For away games, she loves giving us Campbell's chunky soup and microwavable bowls. She makes the road feel like home. Campbell's chunky, it fills you up right. I mean, I used to date these guys, and I, I wonder, why doesn't this feel right? You know, why isn't he the one? And then I met Ben. You know, it's really nice when you realize you don't have to compromise. I mean, not to compare my man to a car, but, I mean, that's why I bought a Saturn. The 2005 Saturn Ion. Redesigned, uncompromised. Now with five years, 60,000 mile extended vehicle coverage, or a $1,000 allowance. The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh on Real Classics, 8 Eastern Sunday. On the next Cheap Seats. A fat tranny in hot pants. Who's your granddaddy? Who's your granddaddy? Roller Games, 10 Eastern Thursday on ESPN Classic. All of my fantasies are coming true, but I, I can't believe it. Wait, wait a minute, I'm, I'm losing fake control here. Welcome back to the 2004 Hockey Hall of Fame induction ceremonies on TSN. Hey everyone, Gino Retta back here along with Pierre Maguire. Pierre, what a great night of celebration and 
What a crew of defensemen and a great builder going in. It makes a lot of coaches better when you have a crew of defensemen like that one. When you think about Raymond Bork, his efficiency is so strong for so long. When you think about Larry Murphy, not only a great puck mover, but he was so strong in keeping the puck in the offensive zone. That was an attribute to his game that never really got recognized. Paul Coffey, you only could appreciate his skating until you skated with him or against him. And having been on the ice with him in practice, you realize how fast he was as a skater, but he was an even a better glider. But he was such an underrated defensive player. And I really got to look at all three gentlemen and say, wow, they make a lot of coaching staffs a whole lot better, but they were great players in their own right. Well, Pierre, they've been voted in, they've been inducted in, and now it's time to sign in. Let's go to Dick Irvin. That's right, Gino. Not quite official yet. Uh, before all the folks have been down here patiently waiting, Paul Coffey, you're the first one, if you will, please. And Paul, just a quick word. This weekend, uh, the culmination of a lot of things has been quite a time the last few days. Well, it certainly has, uh, as we all talked, the week just kept slowly, slowly gaining momentum, and uh, tonight's what it's all about. Paul, oh, Mr. Hay is waiting here with a special gold pen for you to come in and sign in, please. Congratulations again, boy. Nice to have the young fellow with you. Blake, good to have you here. So Paul Coffey signs in as a member of the Hockey Hall of Fame. Cliff Fletcher. Cliff, it's a long way from when you were standing in the snowbanks in Montreal Scouting players for Sam to this night here. You mentioned at the podium it's been quite a weekend for you. Well, it's been a great weekend, and just the, the thrill of entering the Hall of Fame with three great defensemen like these gentlemen here makes it that much more special. Okay, Cliff, Bill's over here waiting to have you come in with the gold pen. You can keep that one. Hey, great, I will. And Cliff Fletcher signs in as a, an honored member of the Hockey Hall of Fame. You know, Larry Murphy, when you and I get together, it's always a happy occasion. Remember that? Two, two, two times in Minnesota and in Chicago when you'd won the Stanley Cups in Pittsburgh. And now this here tonight, it's got to compare a little bit. It's quite a time. Oh, it's a, it is a great time, and it is always good to see you, Dick. And it's <laughs> under the best of circumstances. Right. I don't think it can get any better than it was tonight. Okay, sign in, please. Larry Murphy signing in as an honored member of the Hall of Fame. Raymond, what I want to know is when you're on the 13th hole of the golf course, when you got the call, did you finish the game? I finished it, but I bogeyed that hole. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Quite a time. It really has been an incredible weekend, and this is the, uh, the cap off here. This is uh, coming in with uh, Cliff, Larry, and Paul, uh, all special guys. Uh, this week in the Hall of Fame. I give him a lot of credit. This has been a real special, and I heard it was going to be a special weekend, but I was blown away. Raymond, felicitations, and uh, Bill Hay is waiting for you. Merci beaucoup. It's official. Ray Bork, Paul Coffey, Larry Murphy, Cliff Fletcher, Hockey Hall of Famers. What can the new spring collection teach us about a retirement plan? speeches were terrific. All you had to do is look at the passion level of the guys that were giving those speeches. When you look at the sweat on the brow of Raymond Bork, or the eyes of Larry Murphy, or the way Cliff Fletcher spoke as if he was a politician, but a graceful and skilled politician. But the thing that I admire the most about all of them, including Paul Coffey, is the fact that these guys have such a passion for the game. Yes, the game's going through a hard time right now, but if you think about the passion with which they spoke and the words that they use, caring about their teammates, caring about their parents driving to the rink, and you know, Cliff Fletcher scouting, Dick Irvin alluded to it, scouting in the snowbanks in Montreal. That's what this game is all about. It's not so much about money. It's about winning and losing and caring about your teammates, caring about your fan base, and caring more than anything else about your family. We heard that tonight. And Pierre, and very, it, it's also a terrific way to say thank you to the people that helped them get to where they are today. 
Well, Gino, I mean, we all know that, and whether it's a youth hockey coach, whether it's a coach that worked with them in the junior leagues or whether in the minor leagues or in the NHL, these players appreciate, and Cliff Fletcher really appreciated, scouts and assistant trainers and other people that worked with them. That's what these people really care about, and that's why they're truly ch great champions and Hall of Famers. And you can tell by the smiles on their faces, they couldn't be happier about being in the Hockey Hall of Fame. For Pierre Maguire, Dick Irvin, John Wells, and the entire TSN crew, I'm Gino Retta saying so long and thanks for joining us. But Havlicek steals it. Havlicek stole the ball. Down goes.